two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Sustainiacs. This issue is called Net Your Problem, which is a pretty hip and cool uh, company, organization, movement, all of the above that we're going to be talking to today, doing really cool things. And you guess it, with uh, fishing nets, et cetera, uh, from the ocean near and dear to our house, trying to clean that up and keep it clean is the ocean is what we're trying to do. I'm Mike Vincent. She's Emma Whiteman. Emma, introduce yourself. Say hello to the fine people. Hi guys, Emma Whiteman back again. Haven't been scared off yet, so still here. <laughs> Today we have um, Sarah Aubrey of Net Your Problem, and I can't wait to talk about this. The ocean obviously is something that I'm very passionate about as a marine biologist, so um, I, this is an episode that I expect will be very, very awesome. Yeah, I think so. So, Sarah, you are biz dev or biz and project business and project development at Net Your Problem. We'll get into exactly what that means. But I was stalking you on on LinkedIn uh, to try and you know dig up dirt to shame you. Uh, <laughs> not true. Just trying to get trying to get to you know to, to know you a little bit. And I have a cousin who grew up in La Jolla, so you're coming from the San Diego area, I believe. You're coming from that same that area there. And then yeah, I ran across. Said. I ran, I ran across Grateful Souls Hostel and Retreat Center in Puerto Rico, and my, my cousin was a deadhead, and I wondered if the logo was inspired by, by any of that. Did you follow the dead or do anything like that? No, no. The Grateful Souls came from, I used to have this rule, like, if you want to be my friend, you had to like to share, and then I got a little bit older and revised that to, you had to be grateful. Oh, <laughs> so that's, okay. That's where the name came from. <laughs> I no, I, I love it. I, I love it. And I love what you were doing there. And you went to, uh, you graduated from the University of Virgin Islands as well, which I'm, I'm working with them on a, a different project that I'd love to talk to you about afterwards, because I think our, our two companies would be, uh, could benefit from each other. Let's, let's just call it that right now. Right, but uh, yeah. yeah, so let's, let's get into that a little bit. So you were, how did, what, Tell us a little bit about your background. How'd you wind up in Puerto Rico, probably from the University of Virgin Islands or vice versa, whatever it was. And how did you get into uh, what you're doing now? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, my dad's a zookeeper. He works for San Diego Zoo. And I remember as a little kid, I think I was asking him about the bushmeat project, you know, like, okay, like, why are these people eating these cute little monkeys or whatever it is? And he explained to me, and, and I was pretty young, he's like, well, you know, like, if you're hungry and your family's hungry, like, you don't care if it's an endangered species, like, you're hungry, you know? And, yeah. and that really led me down a path of, like, oh, like, now things are, are, are much different. But for a long time, it seemed like nature and people, they kind of were in two different camps, you know? Like, they everyone was studying them kind of separately, like working on projects, it was either a conservation project or a development project, like not joining the two together. And so I really yeah. wanted to focus my career on, you know, enhancing the environment, protecting the environment, because that also enhances the well-being of people. Yeah, it absolutely does. Now, you were at the San Diego Zoo as well. You worked at the San Diego Zoo, right? I did. I, I did an internship in an endocrinology lab. So we were looking at hormones and different animals and what different uh, procedures in zoos were doing them, trying to figure out, you know, develop pregnancy tests for the animals that they were doing captive breeding for, uh, stuff like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's so, so the, 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 the bush meat project and that type of stuff, did that influence you late, later on as well? Because I know you were involved in uh, an indigenous project or something, indigenous uh, conservation project or something like that. Yeah. Well, um, so, after I I lost my business in Puerto Rico to Hurricane Maria, oh. the property was was on the beach and and it flooded really bad. Not during the hurricane, but on some swells afterwards. So when I came back to California, I had been living in the Caribbean for seven years and really looking for a way to kind of reconnect. And I went to a concert and found a guy who was on a board. He was a singer at the concert. Found a guy who was on the board for this group that uh, does a lot of like cultural food and medicine garden, sustainable housing, that sort of stuff. So I did a lot of native native plant restoration, a little bit of, uh, we built a constructed wetland for wastewater treatment there and uh, a super adobe dome using um, Nader Khalili's Cal Earth. 
bunch, bunch of dirt and a like continuous sandbag to explore some sustainable housing options. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. Very cool. So yeah. you've been all over the place doing all kinds of different, all different over stuff. The place. You were, you were even at, you know what concert it was? It was the, uh, Naco. It was down at the, I don't know what it's called now, but it used to be Coors Amphitheater and then it's had a bunch of different names, but yeah, it was Naco Medicine for the People. Oh. Yeah. That is very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. You run into people when you're open and you're looking, you run into all kinds of blessings and directions that at doors that open up all over the place when you live, I like to say with intention and, and look for that type of stuff. And those of... like-minded people like tend to find yeah. each other, those people that, that, yeah. are, that are grateful, right? Well, it was, yeah. it yeah. was um, the Kumeyaay is, is the tribe that, that is traditionally where I'm from. And uh, La Jolla was actually a really important place for them, but they were giving out like a, a scholarship to a Kumeyaay girl when I got to the concert. So when I met wow. her backstage, I was like, hey, thank you for that. Like, that's super awesome. You know, all the support. And that's how the whole conversation came about. So oh, your yeah. heritage is Kum Kumeyaay. Is that what I just heard you say? No, no, no. Just the native people oh. of where I'm from. Oh, okay. We're, oh, yeah. from where you're from. They, we're right. in that area. Okay. I got you. I got you. That's yeah. really cool. So you were with uh, uh, Noah as well, right? What, did, what were you doing at Noah? Uh, so the project I worked on, they do a lot of research to estimate the different sardine and anchovy stocks off the coast of California for fishermen. Um, actually California fisheries are really cool. They're one of the first ones that started like an ecological approach to, to estimating all that stuff and where they actually take out of their estimate of the population, at least 150,000 metric tons every year. And they set that aside, like to make sure that other animals in the ocean that are interested in those fish get to eat them. But I was oh, wow. uh, yeah. working on a, a project that looked at plankton samples from the last like 60 years and how that coincided with the sardine and anchovy to kind of improve our estimates of what was going on with those fish and keeping a sustainable population while being able to harvest. It's called maximum sustainable yield, right? As much as we can take without harming the population. It, yeah, so, I, still, it, yeah. So still, go working. ahead, Emma. And this is right up Emma's alley. She's yeah, uh, I, and it's just it's uh, interesting to hear it from a different perspective, you know, because it's it's like you're still supporting these fishermen and you're still supporting like these businesses and you're still providing food for people while still doing it in like a sustainable way, right? So you're not like you're preventing overfishing while not saying, hey, you can't do any fishing at all, which I think is like such a cool concept that I don't think a lot of people realize has to be in place like everyone thinks of the ocean as like this big wide place and like endless possibilities which i mean in a way it is but there also has to be someone that comes in and says this is how much you can do sustainably and reliably before you start hurting other people yeah so. yeah have you ever watched wicked tuna sarah or emma no Shop? Okay, so it's like my Sunday afternoon uh, nap show, right? If there's not a boring golf match or some baseball on or something like that that I can watch and kind of zone out and uh, I'll watch that a little bit. But what they're 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 uh, independent tuna fisher, uh, bluefin tuna fisher, fishermen off of off of uh, from Gloucester, from Maine, uh, Massachusetts, and Maine, uh, and. Uh, so they, I mean, they're only allowed to catch one fish a day, right? And so many fish and stuff like that. And it has to be over like 73 inches long and so on. And these guys, like these, these fish, they're catching like 104 inch tuna that weigh like 600 pounds. Right. And then they're getting paid like 18 to 23 to $25 a pound, depending on how good the meat is on these fish. Right. But they're also doing it sustainably. So it's like this race to see who wins, but then. Uh, it's also a race because they only can catch so many in a season and then they shut down the fisheries. Right. And these guys will celebrate a, a, a $10,000 paycheck on a fish or a $20,000 fish as much as they'll celebrate one that's only 70 inches and they get to tag it for research. Right. Cause uh, I mean, they're just, cause that's their livelihood and they're really into this. Hey, you can only catch one fish in this, this many, they figured out a way to exist and be excited about doing that type of stuff. Is that kind of the relationship that you're doing there at, at net problem at net, net problem, net your problem? 
I guess that's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. How has, how are these experiences, like these awesome, really cool experiences, how have those helped get you into net your problems? Do you find that they've like not net your problem? Um, have you found that like it helps you moving forward with them? Like, do you think it's born from that? Yeah, I guess I, yeah. What Michael said. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, I think a common thread is, is working with communities and forming partnerships to get stuff done and that's kind of a lot of of what we do because we're creating a new a new waste management plan doesn't sound very sexy but mm. a waste management plan no, for this type of gear and instead of you know contributing to the landfill or having it in storage forever or wherever it might end up right now it gets to be a bikini or a pair of sunglasses or you know have a whole new life and moving from the linear economy which they have this tagline like take make waste right to a circular economy is kind of the future of where we're going right it's kind of silly to keep extracting resources when we have a lot available so that's what so we were can we just break this down for me oh sorry were you gonna say something no go ahead i guess for for people listening that might not know about net your problem like what would you say so you guys take you guys take yeah. fishing waste and you turn it into product, right? Can you yeah. run us through? What, what, what exactly do you guys do? Yeah. We, I get the overall concept. I understand exactly what you're trying to do. That's what Emma and I are trying to uh, okay. promote here is a circular economy and plastic economy, uh, obviously, and all the other resources as well. But what do you guys specifically do? Yeah, so we work with, with fishermen, ports and harbors, waste management, cities, community, ocean groups to basically develop the logistics plan and figure out the resources that you need to collect this waste, process it, getting it separated into all the different parts, and then send it off to someone who turns it into the raw material for manufacturing. So into pellets or yarn. Wow, I mean, okay, so are yeah. you guys physically doing this stuff or are you guys a consultancy? Because I look on your on your website, your website is excellent, by the way. It's, I love that it's nice, yeah. clean and crisp uh, and, and shows everything. Um, so, But that's what I wasn't figuring out from here is, are you guys physically out there doing it? Because I love the picture of you sitting on this big pile of nets. That's pretty cool. Um, but uh, is that what you're doing? Are you out there with gloves on and hip waders and pulling nets out of the sea? Or you're, you're figuring out the back end of that? Because that is a huge issue as well, right? So we, we work mainly with stuff before it ever ends up in the ocean, right? Make a streamline oh, wow. for okay. it to get it before it ever ends up in the ocean. So we call it end of life gear, right? When you're done with it now, hey, guess what? We are going to do something cool with it. Come see us. And and we do a lot of the, the manual labor of collecting the stuff from the fishermen, separating in the components, getting it shipped out to the right recycling partner. And we try to focus on mechanical recycling if we can't reuse it. But there are a yeah. couple, couple of types that are just mixed plastics that you can't mechanically recycle. And then we do have a couple other options like waste to fuel or uh, we make a construction ag aggregate with some of our partners with some of it. Yeah. So construction aggregate, like you're you're grinding it, drying it, and using it as volume for maybe asphalt or or yep. uh, gotcha jersey exactly. barriers, like gravel. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 Very cool. So you're trying to stay away from the chemical and the incineration as much as possible, right? That, and that makes sense, I guess. Right. Right. Chemical. Yeah. We, we operate with the waste hierarchy, so it's like reduce. Is, is the best thing that you could do for waste, right? Reusing it yeah, as something yeah, yeah. else before yeah. you put any energy into changing its components. And then after that is recycling. After that is is waste to energy and then incineration. Gotcha. I, I look at your projects and I see them. I mean, you're all over, you're all over North America. You guys uh, past North America or just uh, in, in the US? I think I don't even, oh yeah, I think Vancouver. You're up there in Vancouver as well. You got one, right? We, we use some recycling partners um, out of the country, but right now we're just focused on the U.S. We kind of have gotcha. some projects starting um, in other places, but there is plenty of fishing gear here. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what people don't understand, right, is you don't have to go solve the issue in, in Indonesia. 
Right. You, you can solve you can solve it right here. We're 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 throwing plastic into the ocean at at at, at light speed just as. I mean, and then else. the the stuff <laughs> right. we learn here to expand into other places where they have similar problems, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the right here at home is where it needs to start. Honestly. Well, and we have a lot I, of the resources, and you know, some of our problems are not quite as intense, like it places in in developing countries, right? Like waste might not be their biggest problem, right? Clean water might be a bigger problem, you know. Right, Other sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And nutrition might be a bigger problem, and that's probably where their energy and resources should be going. It's just for what we're doing, it makes more sense to do it here right now. Right. I agree with that. And I guess this might be a more technical question and we can save this for like a different, I mean, we don't have to put this on the pod, but, um, how do you ever take like donations of fishing line that's been like collected? Like when I was living in Florida, we had a lot of, um, Hmm. like beach cleanups and we would dive and pick up all the, you know, fishing line and all this stuff off the reefs and, and it would come very, you know, covered in algae or it would be attached to like fishing hooks and lead. Do you ever take any of that? Cause I'm assuming that's like a logistical nightmare to try and parse out what's usable and what's not, or are you strictly focused on just the end of life? Yeah. So actually we do have a project, um, with fishermen in the Florida Keys that there's a couple of groups getting stuff out of the mangroves, you know, still line left from, from the hurricanes in the past that they're yep. collecting and that stuff kind of sits in the sun for a little bit and bakes off some of that organic material and we do have a recycler that that wants to take that stuff yeah oh nice so, okay cool yeah for for the most part it's it's hard to recycle the stuff that's been in the ocean right all the org- organics all the salt kind of messes up your batch and is really hard to clean off mm-hmm. so there there is less less options for that. We did do a, a beach cleanup up on the beaches in Washington state. And there's a company called the bright mark that they, uh, helped pay f- to ship the stuff to their facility in Indiana. And they use the fuel that they make out of that stuff to power a concrete plant. I think. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's so very, very cool. cool. In, in that yeah. case, you know, you can't recycle it. You still want to make it at least useful one more time in its life. So this is, is this, so are you uh, partnering with uh, commercial fisheries mostly? Is that what it is? And fishing uh, like organizations or uh, I guess collectives? Yeah. 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 Big, big fishing companies are definitely our biggest client for sure. Right. Right. I got gotcha. you. So um, like the, the, the amateur and even like the pro bass, uh, are they into anything like this? I mean, I, I mean, fishing line that I would use, you're taking that as well, or just straight the, the specific nets. Yeah. So we focus more on nets and the ropes, which they call line, which is kind of confusing, gotcha. right? In maritime industry yeah. ropes are called line. Yeah. So the fishing okay. line like that comes from a pole that's made of nylon and that stuff is is pretty small volume you gotta have to collect a lot in order to make it worth to ship ship somewhere so we focus more on on the ropes and the nets i got you so the drive is really from the the is really um the pull from your from your clientele and what they need back to them for the recycling of it more than it is you collecting and pushing not that either one is 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 good or bad i'm just saying that that's really the direction right it's not hey let's collect everything off the beach and then find a home for it you're looking for a specific problem keeping that problem from happening and you've already got the partners to take the stuff right and then you just need to expand those services as far as you can Exactly. Yeah, argue is right? actually like, I mean, I guess not more important, but equally as important. I mean, the, well, I think it's a smarter approach. I yeah, think the it's first a much more step in an approach. ocean cleanup is preventative measures from getting the stuff yeah. in there, right? Like, hopefully, yeah. in, in 150 years, we won't have to do beach cleanups because we'll have prevented all the plastic from getting to the ocean in the first place, right? I mean, right, right. I think that's so cool. Well, I, I I really like it, and and how did so? How did the company? Well, how did you first? jump into net your problem because I, I and then i'd like to really how did it develop and move into this because this is this is a really smart approach because if you just go out there and get like 100 people whatever there and and go up and clean up the banks of the lake chicamago over here on, on the tennessee river yeah. we're going to clean up all this stuff and then what are we gonna do with it right I mean, you're not putting it in my backyard 
I mean, it, it, you know what I'm saying? You have all these cleanup efforts and stuff like that. And and as as positive an impact as they're trying to make, and God bless them, and, and do more of it, then where does it go? Into a landfill that then leaches into our water and all that kind of stuff or, or what? You guys are doing it in the smart way. We found these people. They're going to take this stuff. We're going to go clean this up. Somebody else needs to go and figure this other stuff out and, and maybe collect clamshell, you know, the takeaway boxes and figure out how this works. Having that outlet and that circular economy already set up is brilliant. I think that's the really, really smart way to go. What attracted you to net your problem? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in science, you do a lot of research and you're studying stuff and, and it's very interesting. But I think what attracted to me most is the application of the things we knew. And, you know, there's a lot of problems out there, but there's also a lot of solutions. And applying those solutions is really important. You know, sometimes it's easy yes. to get stuck on the problem, but there's uh, it's a really cool time that we're living in right now. There's a lot of solutions. We just got to apply them. So that's my favorite part, like taking action, you know, to actually do stuff about the problems that people find. So that's that's definitely what attracted me to it. Well, I think that's the key too for like a circular economy. Like it, it is very well intentioned to want to go out and clean up a beach, but the the key pivotal point between okay, I'm cleaning up, I'm doing good for the planet, and okay, I'm creating a circular economy, I'm doing good for the planet, is that how can I change this into something different? Like how can I just prevent this from going back into the landfill or honestly going onto the landfill and then falling right back into the ocean where you just took it out of, you know? I mean, that really truly is the key moment yeah it really is it, it it really is so you've you've worked uh in many different capacities like you said your 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 background is very yeah very varied <laughs> uh <laughs> you're all over the place you're in honduras you're in university of virgin islands and you're in puerto rico and then you're in hawaii and then you're in alaska and then you're in the keys and you're all over this place you've you've gone all over the place you've visited all these places you've worked in these uh, very, very important, I would say, and many would agree, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, verticals of conservancy and, and uh, studying the oceans, et cetera. What, what, would, what do you wish that other people knew about this that, is, that, that they don't? Like somebody like me sitting in, in Tennessee. Uh, when you're walking the beach and working in, in Honduras, do you think, man, I wish these people saw this. This would really convince them to do something. What a great question. <laughs> well, I mean, from from what I've seen, the things that get people really excited is seeing the products that can be made out of it later, right? If you recycle correctly, if you follow the rules that need to happen for, you know, the different materials to make sense again, Right, contamination is a huge reason why recycling is not as successful as successful as it could be. Um, but showing people what it can be afterwards gets people the most excited. So I think you know, changing people's mindset from like, oh, I'm throwing this away; it's no good anymore. Like to, I'm putting this over here because next summer, like that's gonna be my bikini, or you know, it's gonna be, <laughs> my, you know. My cousin's wait, a minute, wait, a wait, a wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're going through the nets going, ooh, there's a prime piece of rope right there, or line right there. That's going to be my bikini next yeah, year. Like yeah, yeah, I'm wearing that as <laughs> a next well. And it's a European you know? style bikini, so they don't even have to process the net. They just yeah, throw it cool. together. <laughs> my, wife is, my wife is shopping at Target and, and, uh, and, and Marshall's, and you're shopping on the beach. with that. Ooh, Look at that. <laughs> hey, hey. That's awesome. I yeah. love it. I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. That yeah. is very cool. Um, so do you have, uh, are, are, are there, is every piece of, of, of um, uh, net and, and you have all the different types that are out here and, and that's what I'm trying to think of. And I can't remember them all because there's so many different things you've got them here. And I got, you got like a glossary here, float line, soft buoys, gill net, Gillnet sounds awful. Weed line, <laughs> sink line, all that kind of stuff. I just imagine this net's that's designed to catch a fish by its gills, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah, that's well, pretty their, disgusting. Well, it gets their heads stuck in there, right? So they can't can't go forward. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. Unintentional fish catching. But so are all these already spoken for before you get it? Is there more demand, I should say, than uh, for for than supply? For, you know, for that, you that's a great question. When I first started, that was a big part of what we do. Encouraging companies to use recycled content in their products, like letting people know, hey, Harvard Business Review said like 70% of people, they want to see this stuff. They care about the environment. And actually, um, there was just a study that came out saying that like people really want to care about the environment. But as far as doing something about it they're they're less inclined but what they are really willing to do is change their purchase choices right that's a really easy thing that they can do oh instead of on this side of the shelf i'm gonna reach over here and grab this one um so now yeah they'll even they'll even spend a, per- a little bit they'll even spend a percent more right they'll spend like five ten yeah. percent more i've seen that but yeah they, they definitely will because it helps them feel better about not not doing anything yeah, and now, but now there's actually Europe starting to get these recycled content mandates in some of their products to try to help spur, you know, the part that we do, the collection of it is actually the most expensive part, right? Yeah, it's oh like yeah, absolutely. Very, yeah, very little return for the amount of work involved necessary to getting it. But now that there's starting to be some legislation and more more interest. Now there's a a huge demand. Like the person that we recycle our polypropylene line, you know, they're out there. They want as much as they can get right now. So that's, that's really exciting for us to create demand for what we do. Right. Let me ask you a kind of technical question. Maybe you know the answer. Maybe you don't. You probably do. I would imagine it's, uh, is the plastics that you guys do and considered ocean bound or ocean plastic, or is it certified in any way? Since you're collecting it in a method that is like it, I mean, you're collecting it before it's thrown away. Yeah. So all of the all I mean, of that it, is really trick is it really tricky, right? It, it really is. It's a slippery slope that you can get sued for in a greenwashing suit when you're you just going, well, wait a minute. I mean, this is why or whatever, right? So yeah, explain. Yeah, yeah. So I I actually have to look that. I mean. Technically, hopefully it's not, right? It's not ocean bound, right? It, sh- it should be managed correctly on land. But I think the what everyone is saying is is that it is, you know? But- well, I mean, because, well, the thing is this, is that when somebody purchases it from you and put it in their product, it's more valuable to them if you can say it's ocean it bound is. or yeah. ocean, right? Yeah. And that's what, yeah. that was kind of my question. Is, is that still regardless of how you collect it, it's the proximity to water or a proximity to waterway that will eventually lead to the ocean that determines yeah. that, right? Or the opportunity, you know, like the chance that, yeah. oh, this could end up in the ocean because it could, you know? Well, I think if anything could, it's a fishing line. It's designed to go in the ocean. Yeah, right. So Can I, I <laughs> say something about my research when I did grad school? I was I was trying to hold my tongue, but... In the research that I did in my thesis project, we found so many fibers and most of our fibers that we found and the plastics that we found were consistent with fibers from like fishing line. Like, like there was, I mean, we found so much plastic, but the majority of it, some of the conclusions we came to is we estimated that like something like 80% or something. I can't remember the figure off the top of my head. Wow was coming to us from, well, A, laundry wastewater, but also a huge impact from it was the fishing line because the commercial fishing industry in Fort Lauderdale and Miami is so huge that we had so many fibers that we suspected that were coming from. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that probably depended on on where you're doing your sample from too, right? That, yeah. Yeah, so we did it all the way from like Miami up to Boca and um, the most of the, the, Plastics we found, I guess I should clarify, most of the plastics in Fort Lauderdale, Miami area were consistent with those fishing fishing line fibers. So I just think it's so interesting. I mean, like like we're saying right here, like that is literally, I, I would think that would be the definition of ocean bound. Like it's in the ocean and like, I know you're not collecting microplastics, but theoretically that should be what that definition is used for and not just for like anything that could potentially be close to a river or a sea. You know what I mean? Like it, it all gets so tangled up. It really does. 
Right, no, right. No, no, no pun intended there, right? No pun intended. <laughs> that actually wasn't a good catch. That was good. So what is what is gear buyback program? Is that what you've been describing to us the entire time? Is that basically describe uh, net uh, net your problem, or is that like a separate program? Uh, that that when I got hired, it was to work on a specific project in Southern California. They were phasing out a certain type of fishing gear, uh, the drift gill net. And the fishermen got an incentive to basically return their gear early, right? The legislation takes place. Like buying back guns type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It starts in 2023. If they wanted to relinquish their permit, turn in their nets to show that they're not fishing using that gear anymore, uh, they had a financial incentive to do that, which was pretty cool, which help pay for the recycling of it. I guess that's what I was going to ask too, is like, what would, and, and you, I feel like you have kind of hinted at this, but like, what would an incentive be for a commercial fisher to bring the nets to you besides just other than just like getting rid of them? Like, do, like is, I know you said in the UK, they're getting more stringent about like their, what they allow and stuff like that. So I'm assuming there's some incentive from that, but like, what would, what would prevent like a fisherman who's just going out and and collecting fish from just being like, well, it's too much work to give this to net your problem. Let me just throw this in the trash. Like, what is their motivation? Just a love for the earth, which is a completely acceptable answer, or is it something different? I mean, the, that the whole stewardship component is a is a huge part, right? Like they sure, depend sure. on the health of their ocean for their livelihood. They're That's super true. concerned about it. Right? Like, oh, there, you mean there's a better way? If I can, of course, of course, I would love to do that, you know? Um, sometimes the incentive is that we, we find programs to help pay for that. So instead of paying to dispose of their stuff now, you know, for free, they can get it recycled. Or sometimes it's thing like, oh, we're going to give you some free sunglasses or a knife with a handle that's made of your old right. nets or something. Right. You know, sometimes yeah. it's, it's just some goodies. But yeah, we really have to try to make it easy, easy for them because fishermen work really hard. Yeah. So you don't have to go out there chase them around in little patrol boats and shoot sound cannons and water guns at them and Stuff like that, like Greenpeace or anything no, like no, that. No, no, no. We, we, we <laughs> do the uh, collaborative approach. <laughs> I, get it. I like it. I like that. I like your approach. <laughs> I know. But you meant, yeah, I think it's a better approach. So, uh, but you you mentioned uh, sunglasses and some other products that are made out of this. Do you guys specifically make any products out of this stuff? Or are you just in the supply chain uh, uh, figuring out the logistics to make all this happen? We, we got, we're a small team and we've got a lot of things to do. And so the product space, we really haven't came into too much. Like, sure, sure. Um, we had a project where we were collecting pieces of aquaculture rope off the beaches in the coastal Washington. And we worked with the university up there, their plastics manufacturing program to make crab gauges. So it's like the measurement things. So when you catch a crab, you hold it up to see, oh, is this big enough for me to keep or do I throw it back, you know? Yeah, so well, they was, have the gauges, cool right? Product. They take the little gauges and they go like this. I watched like Deadliest Catch out of Dutch Harbor where you guys are at and they do that that little gauge thing, right? Yep, yep. So we made some, some crab gauges in collaboration with Sea Grant, which was really cool. But we, we haven't got too much in this space. Grundens has a line of stuff out with some of our stuff, but you know, there's brands who, who are popular and and have all the marketing and all those sure. lines already taken care of. So we kind of pass that off to them. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta have a little swag to go, hey, this is what the type of things we can do with this. You need to get on board with this, right? To kind of get right, people right, going. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. what's kind of the most exciting, I feel like. Like I feel like you're like, oh cool, they're recycling nuts, and then you're like, oh wait, I could get a bikini made out of this, or like I could say, Oh, my sunglasses are made from this. Like that's what's gonna <laughs> get people so excited for it too, you know. Yeah, it's In fun. I think it's interesting that Sarah looks for those those choice uh, nets to say that's going to be my uh, hat. I know, I love that. <laughs> I love that. That is that is very cool. So how um what so what do you need? How do I get involved? How does Emma get involved? How do other people get involved? Or do you want us to just stay away from you guys and let you do what you're doing? 
Well, the, actually, we were just having that conversation this morning with some people. For the most part, uh, we try to pay all the people that help us do this, right? Because my boss mm -hmm. really, really um, strongly believes that just because you're doing something good for the earth doesn't mean you have to do it for free, you know? Well, I totally agree with that. If you can make it an economically viable business, that's way better than than it's being supported by the altruistic nature of people because that will wane faster than you can say net your problems at times. Yeah, it's it's hard to have consistent programming. But on, on the other part, if you've got a mission and you want to get something done and that's the way to get it done, then, you know, um, sure. as far as... As far as getting involved, I would say, you know, vote with your dollar, your purchasing choices, you know, keep. Amen. Yeah. Keep supporting programs that are working. Um, we've been we've been trying to get um, fishing gear recycling as part of one of the standards, like for uh, responsible or sustainable fisheries certifications. Right. So, hey, you mm -hmm. know that not only are your fish fish sustainably, but their waste streams are disposed of the best for the environment properly. So look, look for that coming hopefully soon. Um, yeah. And you got a newsletter, right? We have a newsletter. Yep. Yep. You can find out about all our projects and who we've been hanging well, out if you with. Go to, if you yeah, you go to netyourproblems.com forward slash get involved, or you can find it really easy if you just go to netyourproblems.com because I'm looking at it right here. And if I can find it, anybody can can find it. Uh, <laughs> but so do you, is there a list in, in here of the organizations or companies that are involved with you guys so people can say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support these guys. I'm going to buy only these sunglasses and I'm only going to buy bikinis from these people or how do they do that? Or is that too involved because it's just content uh, percentages that are in there? You know, there's there's a lot of, of people doing it now. You know, if you just mm. pay attention to the labels, right? There's gotcha. a lot. There, there'd be a huge long list if we put everybody. And what happens with our stuff is that it – it goes to the recycling plant and then it's mixed in with stuff from all over the place. So chances are a percentage of our stuff is in there, but there's no real way to say, yes, this was from okay. Kodiak, so, Alaska, and now it's in your exact gotcha. yoga pants. Gotcha. You know? So you're not, OP is not buying from you guys. OP is buying materials from somebody else that may have brought it from you. So you're getting it to the middleman who's really recycling the stuff and then supplying these manufacturers with this mix of blended, recycle, and virgin plastics, right? Correct, that, correct. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Got it. Got it. That is very, very, very cool. Um, hey, where do people reach out to you? I know. Hey, go to netyourproblem.com and check out what they're doing there and pay attention to the labels like Sarah said. So Sarah, where do they reach out to you or do you want people to reach out to you? Do you want to be Yeah, yeah. We have or? an Instagram and a Twitter <laughs> and a LinkedIn and all those good things. We we do like promo giveaways with some of the, the brands that are are using recycled stuff that maybe maybe our nets or lines yeah please, very cool please do Here, yeah you know a lot of times it's a big community group that that allows these programs to be possible so right 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 i want to get your take on a couple things before we close out the show if you don't mind i've got this newsletter that or this newsletter <laughs> i've got this news article that came out and people can look at it i'll put it up there it's 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 called oops cleaning the great Pacific garbage patch was probably a bad idea, which is a clickbait headline to tell you the truth. If you've read through this entire thing, it's from Vox.com. If you go to Vox.com, you can, you can see a Benji Jones uh, uh, wrote this, published it on March 4th, 2022. I just thought it was interesting because o the Ocean Cleanup Project is somebody that I think is doing a, a great job and they kind of try and pick at them. We're not going to do that because I think that's ridiculous. People need to get things done. But what they talk about in here, the first point really is, and it's something I think you've already you've already answered, but they think and say that the really most important thing that we can do is prevent plastics and this waste from going into the ocean. And that's more important than cleaning it up is what they specifically actually say. Do you agree with that statement? I mean, obviously, right? Like 
preventing something from ever doing harm in the first place is is the best thing that you can do i mean don't get me wrong like the plastic is in the environment and we should be getting it out definitely right like it's, it's not helping anyone staying there but if if we focus all our energy and all our funding and everything on just that aspect then we're going to keep doing that forever you know yeah and one of the things, and this is to both of you, Emma, because both of you guys are knowledgeable in, Marie, you've studied all this stuff. You guys are both scientists. I am not. i am in been in logistics, which means I went to college to be a, a doctor, and then I switched to be a lawyer, and then I went to be an accountant, and then I became a business major, <laughs> if you know that. Now, that, that that's kind of how my career path went. So I'm in logistics. Um, very, very. <laughs> so, um, but what they say is this, is is because it can be harmful, and I get it, because they're, they're, they're trying to pick on one specific thing. Dragging nets, you can catch fish and that can hurt things. Using boats to drag the nets to grab the garbage patch and stuff like that is you're just spewing more uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions and that type of stuff to get it done. There is no real garbage patch. It's more like a soup, which makes sense. And that's one of the first things that they said is look at them pouring all these huge pieces. They got a bucket here and all this thing coming out of these nets. That's not what the garbage patch is, although that stuff is, is out there. But one of the things that I found interesting in here is that they say that their studies of the plastics that are out there, there are, are marine biologists that say that the vast majority of what they think plastics that gone in, have gone into the ocean, they can't find. They don't know where it went. They're, they're, they're not sure. Does that make sense? Does what that ring true? What I would say is that they can tell that it's congregating. Sorry to okay. jump in here, Sarah. No, uh, no, I no, please. It, I'm asking it, it to either one of you guys. It also has to do with, so the way I'm interpreting this as a microplastic person is that just because you don't see something there doesn't mean it's not there. And I think a lot of people, when you hear the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is an island the size of Texas, like, okay. You can think of it that way, but then you go out in the Pacific Ocean, you're like, where's all the garbage? Like, we're doing just fine. But a majority <laughs> of the things that are out there are these microplastics that are so small, you you really need a microscope to be able to see these things. I mean, occasionally you'll get like the big bats and the drums and the rubber duckies, whatever that news article was that washed into the ocean and the shoes and, and all these plastic yeah. things. But like a majority of the plastic that's in the ocean is microplastics and and i think that that would be extremely difficult to clean up number one and i also think that they're everywhere like we can tell they're congregating in certain spots but like we don't it's not that we in my opinion it's not that we don't know where they are we can't find them in my opinion it's that they're everywhere and like cleanup efforts that people have come up with are really cool and really interesting but they're not capturing the majority of the plastic, which is the microplastics, they're catching the big, you know, drums, which is important in its own way. I, I don't know. I, I hope I'm not talking in circles. I would love to hear what you, what you think about it too, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what we find and what's actually out there, right. It's like what we find the big pieces that are floating, you know, there, there's plenty of pieces that are sinking that we don't find or is really yeah. expensive to find if you want to go they're both, in the bottom of the ocean. They're both out there. The thing that you can tell by whether it's floating, sunk, or micro is how old it is. <laughs> I think really, right? It's kind of like counting definitely rings on a tree, it, right? I, I would think it does. I mean, I, I, I'm no expert. I'm not a scientist. We already covered that, but I, I think that would be it is. So you, you agree, um, I, I would think that Turning the spigot off, as they as they say in this article, which I agree with, is is really where we can have the greatest impact, and we need to be focusing our efforts on. We should be focusing our efforts on cleaning the up the ocean as well. But turning off that spigot is really, really the important thing at this particular moment, because as they say, it's like mopping up a a, a puddle while the spigot's going. Right? You agree with that? Yeah, but I mean, you know, all cleanup groups should be hoping they'll be out of business, you know, sometime soon, right? That's exactly right. I agree with that. I agree with that. Hey, Sarah, yeah. thank you so much for being on the show. This has been awesome. I, I have a new understanding of what net your problem is. And I also, and, and I, a newfound admiration for what you guys are actually 
doing. I, I love the business model. I think it's awesome. Netyourproblem.com. Uh, is it Sarah at netyourproblem.com uh, as well, right? Yes, it is. S A R A. Right on, right on. And you yeah. can reach us just about anywhere at the Sustainiacs, the Sustainiacs at gmail.com. If you got a question, topic covered, you want a topic covered, you got a product, you got a company, you know of anybody, Sarah's going to hook us up with everybody. She knows that we should be interviewing. She's already promised that. Um, <laughs> she just did. She didn't know that. Uh, but TikTok, Facebook, Emma, where are they reaching you out uh, at reaching out to you at? Emma underscore Sustainiacs on Instagram. Um, you can also reach me any of the, any of the ways, Michael, uh, mentioned before and we're always right open up. for ideas if you know anybody that's looking um to get their opinions out there and you know any scientists that look into this side of stuff kind of if you have any ideas send them our way and we'll look into it um yeah. especially it was so nice having a scientist and activist and someone who's in the midst of it here on the show today so sarah we really appreciate you coming on that was a great conversation yeah, yeah i appreciate really you was. guys thank you so much for having me so sarah let me ask you this last thing do you have to change your lifestyle in order to care or can anybody care and make an impact? I mean, what I always tell people is that whatever is important to you, whatever you're passionate about is the best way for you to make any kind of lifestyle changes, right? If you really care about it and think about what aspects of your life that you can devote to helping that area like that's the one that you're gonna keep doing that's the one you're gonna do the best at right awesome and, uh, awesome other than that you know there's a lot of cool a lot of cool technologies coming out to help fill in fill in the gaps on the other side there so <laughs> oh yeah absolutely absolutely um anything coming up from net uh your problems that you want to plug or push or anything like that uh yeah we're we're in the midst of hiring a, a new person in maine and massachusetts we've got some warehouses there we're rolling out some big problems there we what they, does this uh, person need to do what's the job uh talk with fishermen collect gear separate it make friends with the community and uh wow yeah <laughs> very cool all right. Yeah. Do they need to speak Southie? Do they need a Southie accent? <laughs> well, as long as the fishermen can understand them, they're... then they might need one. <laughs> yeah, they speak fishermen. That's what we are looking for. Yeah, everybody help. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been the Sustainiacs. Peace and love, everybody. Thanks. Hey.